Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. Thank you so much for being here. This is episode 28, I believe, and today we're going to break down Planet of the Symbiotes. And the reason we're going to talk about this story today is because, as in the episode with Lethal Protector, this is another series of the comic book that apparently the movie's taking inspiration from. So we heard that they're going to take some storyline elements from the Lethal Protector miniseries, the first one, because I know we're going to give out in this episode a code for the newer one that just came out with Mark Bagley and Mike Acosta writing it, Mark Bagley doing the artwork. It's great seeing Bagley draw Venom again. So that first comic, uh, you know, issue or whatever, I'll give away right now. Actually, I'll put it up on screen, and uh, and that's for the new Lethal Protector. But we talked about the original '90s miniseries Lethal Protector, and that is what the new movie is kind of uh, pulling elements from. But it's also pulling elements from this story called Planet of the Symbiotes, which came out in the mid '90s, and uh, and that was kind of an interesting time for Spider-Man stories because and Venom actually. Uh, because Spider-Man had been going through a lot. Uh, his parents came back, and then, it, but then he found out they might not have really been his parents, and then Aunt May got sick, and that drew the attention of a character that we all thought was dead for many, many years, which was the clone of Spider-Man. So, like, back in, like, the 70s and stuff, they actually did a storyline where Spider-Man got cloned, and the clone apparently died. And it was a story that involved the Jackal and Gwen Stacy and everything, and the clone, we thought, died. Turns out he's still alive, and he's been living for five years, out on his own. He moved to like Salt Lake City, went other places, and there was another clone of Spider-Man called Kane that was like pursuing him, like an evil clone, and he was trying to kill Ben before Kane himself died of degeneration, because that's what happens to a lot of the clones in the comic books. They kind of uh, melt. Uh, you know, they, they can only sustain life for so long, and then they just kind of melt. And so Kane was chasing Ben and was hoping to kill him before Kane himself melted. And while Ben was out there, he was like, you know, living living really low key. Peter Parker's always been poor, but Ben lived really poor. And he was like working at little restaurants and diners, making money where he could and kept on the road, got a motorcycle and just kept moving. But he heard while on his travels that Aunt May was sick. And so he decided to come back to New York and, uh, and, and try to at least pay his respects secretly and then get the heck out of Dodge before anyone saw him. Unfortunately, Peter Parker saw him and it caused a conniption fit between everybody. And then thus began the Clone Saga, which uh, if you haven't read comic books and you don't know what I'm talking about, it was a really bad time for Spider-Man because a lot of fans who had been reading the comics and liked them up until that point, a lot of them left the book. And a lot of new people were interested but weren't really liking it too much either because the middle of the story got really convoluted and it dragged out for a lot longer than it probably should have. So in this, we had the clone of Spider-Man who goes by the name Ben Riley, named after Uncle Ben, and he took uh, Aunt May's maiden name, which is Riley. So Ben Riley and his alter ego was the Scarlet Spider. And he had Peter Parker as Spider-Man. And during this whole event, is when Planet of the Symbiotes happens. And now in the comics, Peter Parker has never physically beaten Venom. He's always tried to outsmart him, or he ran away from him, or he tricked him, you know, something like that, or he used the Fantastic Four, helped him trap, you know, the symbiote or whatever. He's never really just one-on-one -on -one punched and beat up Venom. And that's also, you know, makes sense. Peter Parker's not exactly a brawler. He can handle himself in a fight, but that's not, he's not like Batman, who's just like knocks someone out and punches until they knock him out. Uh, but Ben kind of did do that. He, in a storyline called Separate, well, actually it was a storyline before Separation Anxiety. Um, it was a little crossover between some of the Spider-Man books when Ben first became a Scarlet Spider. The first enemy he took down was Venom. And he did it by punching him like over and over and then using like new tricks, new webbing, new like little spikes that he shot out of his wristbands. Like he was ready for combat and he took down Venom. So there's not a lot of love between Peter Parker or for Ben Riley and Venom. Uh, even though the Venom symbiote recognizes Ben and notices something familiar about him, but he also notices it's a copy. He's like, all right, it feels like Peter Parker, but it's not Peter Parker. Um, and so there's like a kinship there, but he also is afraid of him because Ben single-handedly whooped the crap out of him. So with that backstory laid out, we come to this storyline, Planet of the Symbiotes. So I don't know what the movie's going to pull from this, but I will say what I hope they pull from this. Obviously, they're not going to pull any of the Spider-Man stuff, the Scarlet Spider stuff. Uh, really, when you look at the story, this is a, a, a Venom story with Carnage in it, too. And I know we haven't done a Carnage origin episode yet. I promise we'll get to that. So I'll try to talk about Carnage loosely and just kind of vaguely, uh, and we'll dive full on into him in a future episode. Uh, but in this story, it kind of starts off and Eddie Brock's on a rooftop. Uh, actually, it starts with Spider-Man fighting some goons. Luckily, they're like three blocks away from Eddie Eddie Brock and Eddie Brock sees it and gets involved but he's on a rooftop before he sees the battle happening and he's kind of reflecting on his life and he says you know I was willing to kill myself like after everything went wrong in my life I went to that church and I asked for forgiveness for the sin I was about to commit which was suicide I was going to take my own life and uh, and then the symbiote showed up and changed my life and it turned my hatred towards Spider-Man and it made me think if I kill him now uh, that will 
that will is what I really need. It's not killing myself, but killing Spider-Man is what I really need. So Eddie Brock now is looking at himself going, you know, I never really wanted to ever kill anybody. And I have killed a, more than a couple people now since I bonded to you. So are you the reason I'm killing? Like, do you want to kill people? Is this part of who you and what you are? Um, because it's not part of who and what I am. And, and so he starts reflecting on his time with the symbiote. So I feel like that might be the element maybe that the movie is going to pull from is like this little personal story that happens in the middle of all this big action. Because really what happens is they, they kind of touch on that and then they get right into the action and it has Spider-Man teaming up with Scarlet Spider um, who dresses in a red costume with a blue hoodie. And I only mention the blue hoodie in case you don't know who he is, but I'll have a picture here. I'll, I'll mention, I mention the blue hoodie because it plays into the storyline actually in this one. Um, so as they get into some fights and they're fighting these goons, uh, Eddie basically comes to the conclusion, all right, I don't want the suit anymore. I need, or at least I need a break from it. I need some time to think without it attached to me because I think it's swaying my thoughts. I think it's making me murderous and I need to really clear my head. So he's yelling at the symbiote, like, get away from me. I don't want you anymore. And, uh, and it breaks off of him. And it, as it goes out into the, like the wild, it like, how it lets out this big screech, this howl and it's like in pain and you see it affecting people, people that are maybe on the on the spectrum or have been affected by the symbiote before, uh, you'll see them like having a reaction to it no matter where they are in the world. Dogs are howling, you know, at the moon and stuff. So it, it has an effect. This, this sound is not heard by everyone, but it's affecting everything that can hear it. Well, it turns out the sound is actually going past our atmosphere and into space. And there is a, a, a ship out in space that hears it, and this ship is full of other Clintars. And Clintars are actually the real name of the alien symbiote that once controlled Spider-Man and now is part of Eddie Brock. So this group of Clintars, they actually, you know, after they hear the scream, they start heading towards Earth. And they, they don't have all the technology they need to build like a Stargate to bring the rest of their planet to Earth. So they're secretly moving around, infecting people, um, attaching onto hosts, and, and you know, corrupting them and, and moving them to get pieces that they need, technology, human technology, and bringing it all together. And they're out in the middle of the woods, like, you know, uh, north of uh, New York City. They're like trying to, um, you know, build a big stargate to kind of summon uh, the rest of their race. And so while this is happening, Eddie Brock hears about some of these murders because some of the symbiotes are attaching to people, but they're like killing guards at these facilities where they're stealing technology from. And, uh, and it gets the attention of Spider-Man and Scarlet Spider who are investigating the murders, but also gets the attention of Eddie Brock, who is now without a symbiote, but he thinks it's his symbiote. He's like, oh, I think I rejected my symbiote and it's out there hurting people now. And it's my responsibility. I should come deal with this. So I don't know if I'm going to kill it or if I'm going to hurt it. I have a big gun just in case, but I'm just here to maybe mainly talk to it and try to get it to stop. So Peter and Ben and, and uh, Eddie all make this like uneasy alliance to uh, to get the symbiote back. And what they realize is that it's not actually Eddie symbiote that is doing all this. It's all these other symbiotes. And it leads them into the woods where they find the Stargate. And they're, you know, about to be attacked by all these symbiotes. There's like maybe a dozen symbiotes on this ship. So there's about 12 or 13 or so uh, symbiotes ready to attack. And they actually open the Stargate on accident uh, early. And Eddie Brock and Peter and Ben, they all get thrown in there. And they end up on the planet of the symbiotes. So now these three are on the planet where the symbiote comes from. And we learn that actually the symbiote is different than other Clintars. The one that Venom was attached to, it's a little different. All the other symbiotes attached to a life form and you see in this book that they attach to other alien life forms and they just suck them dry anything they bond with they completely take over suck them dry and once there's no more nourishment they can get out of them they dispose of the bodies and move on to the next one and that's the ultimate purpose of these clintar race of these symbiotes is to do just that and that's how they survive and live is by just feeding off of they're more like parasites and less like symbiotes in a way uh, but eddie's symbiote that one was different. It was born different, it always acted different, and it didn't just feed and discard. It still has the knack for killing and wanting to kill because it's part of its like inner workings in a way uh, and biology, but it doesn't naturally gravitate towards it all the time. And when it was cast out, it was kept as a prisoner on Battle World, which is where Spider-Man found it in that machine that he thought made costumes, and he let it loose and it, you know, it wrapped around him. Then he rejected it. So once again, the symbiote who was rejected by his own race is now rejected by his new family, his new race, Peter Parker, and then found Eddie Brock and thought, all right, maybe this is our, our second chance. You know, I, I can, I can, you know, make my way back into this world. I can feel accepted. I have someone who also felt rejected. This is a perfect match. But unfortunately that didn't work out. And Eddie at the beginning of this story told the symbiote to go away. So now you're learning that this thing is hurting in a way, and it has been rejected its whole life, much like Eddie Brock. 
And as these three are on this new planet now, and they're just being converged on by hundreds of symbiotes coming at them, waiting for the gate to open fully so they can all go through, they're like, well, at least we have some fresh meat for right now. So Ben and, and Eddie and Peter, they all have to like fight off these symbiotes and try to, you know, like get away. Luckily, Eddie's symbiote, the actual symbiote that he always had, the Venom symbiote, it's been attached to Ben and disguised as his hoodie. So it's there helping them. So it comes off and it's helping, uh, you know, uh, Scarlet Spider without him really realizing it at first. And then it makes itself known and reattaches to Eddie. And he's like, you know, are you sure this time? He's like, well, let's make it temporary, but we need to get out of here. We both need to survive because your race hates you and it hates us. So we got to stop this. We got to shut down the Stargate and we got to get back to Earth. And the Clintar race now has a fully open Stargate ready to come to Earth, and they all start piling through. And on the other side, it's just little old Venom, Scarlet Spider, and Spider-Man trying to stand in their way. Uh, but little do they know that something's happening in the background with Carnage that is building up, and he's going to turn out to be kind of their saving grace, but also the ultimate threat they have to deal with. So as this big battle's waging and they're fighting all these symbiotes, Carnage shows up and he starts absorbing the symbiotes. He found out that he can, since he was born on Earth, uh, from Venom symbiote, and he's like his uh, like asexual offspring, he ha he kind of has a different biology. He's he's changed because he was born in a different atmosphere. So he acts different, he thinks differently, and he uh, is biologically differently than uh, the other symbiote. So he finds out that if he absorbs one, it actually he grows in mass. So basically you have attack of the 50 foot carnage and you have carnage absorbing the symbiotes off of all these people. Cause remember the symbiotes, the 12 on earth and then the ones coming through, they're now just jumping on people trying to get hosts. Well, carnage is single-handedly sucking them all up and he's becoming like this giant 60 foot, you know, carnage and he's terrorizing through New York. So as Eddie Brock and Ben and, and Peter are, need some downtime to recuperate from some of the wounds they sustained, they go back to Peter's apartment. They're all there with Mary Jane. There's some comedic moments with Venom, but Venom starts to realize, hey, I, I know what we have to do. Uh, because Carnage was born on Earth, um, you know, he's not going to be affected by this, so it won't stop Carnage, but it might stop the symbiotes inside of him. Um, the symbiotes have this thing about them, have this way about them, and if you, if you, they're very emotionally driven. They're very much attuned to like an emotional spectrum, and they, they act purely on emotion and, and sometimes instinct. If we can override their emotions, make them feel too much, overstimulate them, maybe they'll all shut down possibly go into a comatose state. And he's like, I think it's worth a try. So Spider-Man and, and Ben are like, all right, let's do this. Let's let's give it a shot. So they go out into battle. They're fighting giant carnage. Venom slips away. He goes into the church where, you know, not I don't know if it's the same church where he, he was going to commit suicide and met the symbiote or if it's a different one, but he goes into a church. Symbolically, you know, it kind of works. So he goes into a church and he st he's talking to the suit and the suit is like, look, we can do this, but if I'm going to survive what you're about to do, I have to truly bond with you. Like, we have to really become one for sure this time. No separating, uh, you know, can happen. We have to really bond. And that, may, that means if we ever are separated, we're both going to be in agony until we come back together. And so the suit's like, are you willing to make that commitment with me? Are you willing to accept me? And Eddie's like, yes, are you willing to accept me? So it's basically, story moment-wise, for these characters, it's, uh, again, written by David Michelini, who did a lot of the Venom stuff. So I feel like this was his way of going, okay, I really want these two characters to have kind of like a closing to their original arc of being unaccepted, you know, by different various, out, you know, outer elements. And so now they're accepting each other. So they bond in a way that is pure for both of them to where it's like they become literally like one being in a way. And so, uh, so now that they're together, they go out and set off this plan to overstimulate the symbiotes, which they do. And Unfortunately, which Peter didn't know this was going to happen and Ben didn't know this was going to happen, but Eddie did. Eddie realized once he bonded with the suit, the suit's like, look, they're not my race anymore. They're not who I want to save. I want to save your world. Will you help me save your world? It's like a big moment for the character and, and a big revelation for the Clintar of uh, turning his back on his own race. And so what he he says, yes, he goes, here's the true plan. It's not going to overstimulate them and put them in a coma. It's going to make them do something far worse. And what happens is essentially a mass suicide. Pretty much the thing that has followed Eddie Brock around ever since we met him in that church and he was praying, you know, that he was going to kill himself. You also had uh, the, the, the tweaker friend of his, the guy who was like former military, who he tried to get help from. Uh, and got strat military strategies from, and then Eddie Brock paid him some money, and then that guy used that money to get heroin and OD'd on it. Another suicide. You had um, his wife, Ann Weying, suicide, although I don't know that that happened yet in the books at this point. But again, suicide being a constant theme in Eddie Brock's life. 
And kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do the show was because of my past experiences with, you know, with that. So having Eddie being surrounded by it again and choosing to do that with the symbiote and going, okay, we're going to overstimulate this race of, of aliens, but it's going to cause them to kill themselves. They're going to be in so much agony and they're going to be feeling so much. It's almost like like depression in a way they're going to give up and they and all the symbiotes kill themselves and flood out of uh, a carnage and carnage goes back down to regular size in which case you know the combined might of Ed eddie and and uh, ben and everyone they're able to like stop him uh, and i think i actually think he gets away kind of but they all you know fight him nonetheless and and, and you know, save the world and everything and so it's a big moment for venom because he's actually the hero in a way uh, but at the cost of killing almost an entire race. I mean, not every symbiote came through. Uh, not every member of the Clintar race came through, but a bunch of them did. Uh, so Spider-Man and and Ben kind of like, Spider-Man, especially Peter, lashes out. The idea of like a, almost a near genocide right in front of him. He's like, you killed all of them. You lied to us. You said it would put them in a coma. You didn't say it would kill them. And, and Eddie's like, yeah, but you know, they're better off dead. And he's like, they, I saved the world. Like, what do you want from me? And Ben is kind of like, yeah, he, he's kind of right, Peter, and Peter is not, like, he, he you know, he, he doesn't like the loss of really any life, um, as no matter how monstrous they are, and that's just the what makes Peter, Peter, uh, you know, so, so Ben is not that attuned to that, and he's kind of like, oh, well, the world is saved, that's all I care about, uh, and Eddie's, and, you know, kind of the same thing, he's like, yeah, I, I saved the world, you're welcome, basically, and, uh, and he goes off, and so the storyline at the heart of it is a story about acceptance. It, it has all this big craziness all over it, these crazy, insane symbiotes coming through. But really, if the movie's going to take anything from this, I feel like it's probably going to take the Eddie stuff because Eddie does, you know, go through this journey in the story. And if you look at his long history of like from the birth of Venom, Trade Paperback that we talked about all the way till this moment, you know, it's about acceptance with him and the symbiote and both them, both of them finding someone who finally accepts them uh, for what and who they are and, and are willing to grow into something better together. And that's kind of really what it is. It's like this weird, like love story in a way uh, where these two accept each other. And that's, that's kind of the, the purpose of Planet of the Symbiotes is to establish some of the origins of the Clintar race, show you what they are, what they, what they're capable of. Um, and then also putting Eddie in this position where he makes a real choice and where he decides, all right, I am, on this hero's path, this anti-hero path in a way, but I'm on this hero's path, but it's going to require sacrifice uh, from not just me, but my other half, my symbiote. And and he just proved to me he's willing to make it. So I trust him again. And we're going to go on this, you know, wherever the world takes us, we're going together. And I feel like that's a good story for the movie too, is like you have him, you saw in some of the clips we saw from the movie, he's rejecting the symbiote. And then I'm, I imagine by the end of the movie, he'll fully accept it. And I feel like that's kind of the stuff they're probably going to pull from this storyline. Although they may also pull the potentiality of an evasion as well. Because I was thinking about that. Like, oh, a Stargate that could open up and bring everything here. And then you see other symbiotes and you're like, oh my goodness, it's going to be playing the symbiotes. And then maybe Eddie shuts down the machine or or Ann Wang shuts down the machine or something like that. And it prevents the thing from happening. But either way, a good final set piece for a movie uh, in a big giant room with a Stargate or out in the woods with a Stargate and a potential alien invasion. Um, I think that could be cool too. So that was Planet of the Symbiotes. Let me know what you think of that. Have you read it? Do you have a favorite moment? Let me know down in the comments below. I really appreciate you guys supporting this channel. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.